Welcome back in here to live now from Fox. I'm Andy Mack. Thank you so much for joining us. We want to get out to more details, more developments there in the war in Israel. And of course, the broader potential conflict, of course, a live picture right there out of Gaza, as well as we continue to follow all of this new information here on live now from Fox, including an airstrike at the Jabalia refugee camp there. The battalion, of course, we're following it here on live now from Fox. Of course, this a tweet from Jonathan Shanzer saying Hamas indicating it will release some forward hostages soon, just as Ibrahim Bihari, head of Hamas Jabali battalion, reported to be killed by the IDF. He was involved in the planning and execution of the terrorist attack back on the 7th there. And we want to continue here on Live Now from Fox. We want to bring in right now the vice president there for the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, Jonathan Sandor. Thank you so much for joining us here on Live Now from Fox. What do we make of this latest airstrike and how important of a figure is it did IDF take out? Well, we can't really say for certain how important he is. He's not top 10. You might say he's top 25, let's say, of the most wanted figures uh, you know, within the Hamas organization that the Israelis are stalking. I think he was just, he happened to be in the line of fire, is my guess, or maybe they, they decided to take out some underground infrastructure. Um, this uh, area, Jabalia, as it's known, um, it's technically, they call it a refugee camp. It's not. It's it's high. It's it's densely populated, but uh, as most people probably know, um, there are not many refugees left uh, at this point. Uh, we're talking about the descendants of refugees, people who are still claiming to be refugees. Nevertheless, it's a densely packed area, urban warfare, and the Israelis have taken out what appears to be a significant underground target. Uh, which is a large part of what's going on right now in that war. There's a whole underground infrastructure that is um, posing a, a severe threat to the Israeli troops as they're on the ground. And so I think we're going to see more of that, large bombs that take out whatever is lurking beneath. Yeah, that is a very, very interesting because I think a lot of the initial reports talked about the refugee camp as well and the IDF putting this on social media as well, saying the IDF operating, taking out this terrorist stronghold, the stronghold used for training, execution of terrorism activities. I do want to put up just some more tweets here from Trey Yingst as well, because obviously this felt similar to that hospital airstrike as well, where the Palestinian, the Gaza officials coming out with it saying, more, many Palestinian civilians killed at the Jabalia camp in northern Gaza. Palestinian source claims multiple Israeli strikes targeted the area. They're checking with information. There's a statement from the military as well that says the Israeli Defense Force led by the have seized control of the Hamas military stronghold in western Jabalia. Of course, uh, you mentioned maybe not a lot of refugees still in that location is maybe the information that comes out initially. How important is that? Because, of course, you talk about an airstrike by Israel. You talk about refugees, of course, civilians. Uh, how maybe important is the information kind of war right now amongst especially something like this? Oh, it's huge. I mean, the, the, the amount of disinformation that's flying around, um, I, I think, is, is really notable. Um, you know, a few, a few things, I think, to, you know, in order to try to understand and digest this story. Number one, the Israelis have asked for all civilians to clear out of the northern Gaza Strip. Jabalia uh, is in the northern Gaza Strip. Uh, and so when the Israelis go in and are either fighting on the ground hand to hand, really kind of face to face urban combat, urban warfare, um, you know, these most of them at this point, most of the people that they're uh, encountering uh, are going to be militants or people that are likely associated with Hamas. That's not to say that there aren't civilian casualties. I'm sure there are. And, of course, we don't want to see any of them. But I would say that uh, the Israelis have asked all civilians to clear out to the extent that that's possible. So that there, there's that. That's number one. Number two, uh, you know, the sheer number, the, the actual number of refugees, it, it's, it's almost negligible. I mean, I think there's maybe 10,000 in all of the Gaza Strip right now. Uh, maybe 20. Um, it's a hard thing to say, but these would be the elderly people from the 1948 war. We're not talking about now there are people who are literally trying to get out of the way of this war. One could call them refugees, but the camp itself was not one, not in, in real terms. Now, the bombing itself, um, there are interesting reports about how the Israelis hit a target 
and then after that, the ground began to crater um, as a result of the underground infrastructure that we talked about. And again, a lot of this, it's fog of war. We just don't know the facts. We're dealing with snippets of information, what we hear out of the Israelis, what we hear out of Hamas, where they're, of course, not likely to be terribly honest. Um, but again, as you suggest, the disinformation, the amount of information flying around that is designed deliberately to obfuscate, it's, it's a huge part of what I have to sift through uh, every day. Yeah, it is very difficult to see because because the initial report comes out and that's what people generally run with. But of course, the fog of war, like you said, a lot of more information coming out uh, as they come. I do want to give you out to a different development there talking about Houthi. And of course, now Houthi, the group there, the rebel group from Yemen, claiming a surface-to-surface -surface middle, targeting Israel as well. Give me kind of a breakdown. Who is Houthi and maybe why was this development and why did they claim it today? Okay, so um, this, this it's actually kind of a wild story. So really since around 2015, maybe even a little bit earlier, there's a group that's been based in Yemen. Yemen has, has been dealing with a civil war since the outbreak of the Arab Spring. Um, this group has conquered large chunks of Yemen. They are, um, at this point, almost fully aligned with Iran, much like Hamas is, much like Hezbollah is, um, except Iran has used the, this Houthi group primarily to target Saudi Arabia. Um, they've been carrying out attacks in the Persian Gulf against some of Iran's uh, enemies there. Um, and uh, so just the, the, the quick background on this is right as Donald Trump was leaving office in 2020, he added them to the U.S. terrorism list. As soon as the Biden administration came in, they removed the Houthis from the terrorism list. And uh, it was kind of a finger in the eye to the Saudis. And it was, I think, question, the whole thing was, was really not a, a, a terrific episode in American foreign policy. Not a lot of consistency, you can put it that way. Um, anyway, the Houthis have continued to engage in all manner of violent activity. And they always, one of their, their slogans is death to America, death to Israel, death to the Jews. This is what they say at every rally. So you get a sense of who they are and what their values are, so to speak. Um, anyway, so what you fast forward to today, and um, they fired a long-range missile at, at Israel. The Israelis intercepted it with the Arrow Defense System. This is a system joint, uh, that was jointly developed with the United States. It's a real asset um, for Israel and for the U.S., I think. Um, and then the Houthis claimed responsibility and have actually since declared war against Israel. The yeah. likelihood of of us seeing a ton of missiles or rockets out of Yemen, it's low, but it is interesting right now that Iran appears to have activated, and it's really important to note this, there's obviously what we're watching in Gaza, there's a full-blown, you know, uh, all-out war happening in Gaza right now, but then you've got rockets out of Lebanon from Hezbollah, you've got rockets out of Syria uh, targeting U.S. Uh, bases. You've got rockets out of Iraq targeting U.S. bases. You've got rockets out of Yemen targeting Israel. And you've got ongoing unrest in the West Bank. What Iran has done, just to be crystal clear, it has started a regional war. Now, there is there are still ways to contain that war, to keep it only in the Gaza Strip while absorbing fire from all these other places. But Iran is very much trying to activate all of its proxies and all of its allies across the region to try to put Israel uh, in a position where it can't be defended. I don't think it's going to happen. Obviously, the U.S. is there and the, and the Israelis have quite a bit uh, left in the tank in terms of the fight in front of them. But uh, you get a sense of the strategy that Iran has tried to adopt here. Yeah, and it's a lot of complicated facts, and I think you explained it uh, very well there because there's Hamas, Hezbollah, now Houthi as well getting involved. And like you mentioned, I think a big point of this is potentially not a, a part of that terrorist group as well. And of course, we did see U.S. forces maybe go after a proxy in Syria. Potentially, could they, Houthi, be placed back on the terrorist group? And would that maybe open the U.S. to maybe containing that kind of aspect of this larger regional conflict as well. Is that a possibility? Look, it's a possibility, but let, let me put it in maybe a, a slightly different way. It's a possibility the U.S. designates the, the, the Houthi rebels again, and, uh, and then the next thing you know, they're targeting the U.S. 
uh, more directly. So it's possible that it can antagonize them. Of course, they're already on the offensive, right? They're already on the wrong side of this conflict. But what's so interesting right now is that the, uh, the Saudis have a senior delegation here in Washington. They're meeting with the White House. And if you recall, the Saudis were on the cusp right before all this started. They were on the cusp of a possible normalization deal with Israel. Uh, and it would be brokered by the United States. And it was really designed to signify a new U.S.-led regional order in the Middle East. If the uh, U.S. decides to designate the Houthis again, this could be a significant move to, let's say, bury the hatchet with the Saudis. As we all know, the Saudis and the Biden administration have not been getting along famously. But I think that a move like this would really speak volumes. It might really engender better ties and hopefully, potentially, uh, begin to forge a path back to normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And that would be great news amidst this war. Yeah, and I was going to ask you about Saudi Arabia because, of course, Yemen, they're kind of on the so southern part of that uh, kind of peninsula as well. But uh, we also have a carrier strike group potentially moving to the Gulf. Maybe how does Saudi Arabia, both geographically and politically, factor into what is happening with the Houthis? Well, I mean, the, the Saudis have been the number one target. Um, there was a deal reached earlier this year between Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, during which both sides uh, agreed to respect the other's uh, uh, territorial integrity. Um, and I think that was really a sign that the Houthis were going to be off limits so long as the Saudis didn't try to undermine the regime inside Iran. Um, and, and so that's where we've been up until now. I think right, the Saudis have to be a little nervous uh, now that they're watching the Houthis begin to activate. This, there's actually been three missiles fired at Israel by the Houthis since this war began. And so the Saudis have to be a little bit nervous here. Um, I think that Probably for now, at least, they uh, they don't feel like they're in the crosshairs. But you know, wars have a way of, of uh, unraveling, right? Things can deteriorate rapidly. So I think having the Saudis in the U.S. right now looking for assurances from the U.S. is very important. And I think there's something else that's important to note here that, you know, the, the Saudis have been a little ambivalent about the U.S. for some time now, not sure that the U.S. is the superpower that it once was, not sure that the U.S. would have Saudis back in the event of a conflict. When you look at what's going on right now in the Middle East, as Israel found itself, you know, on the receiving end of a just a horrific massacre on October 7th, it was the United States that immediately sent significant military assets to the Middle East. And I think that the Saudis looked at this event and said, you know what, maybe the United States is still an ally that we can work with, and maybe it's worth trying to rebuild what we had and to start from scratch. I'm hoping that that's where we are right now. I think it would be good for the United States. It would be good for the security of the region. It would be good for um, uh, the oil economy that we are always concerned about. Um, and it would be good for normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel, who are really still two of our most important allies in the Middle East. It'll be really important to keep them together and on side and with us. Yeah, and, and like you said on social media several times, it's kind of foreign policy on the fly, and it could be potentially uh, an asset there for Saudi Arabia, for the United States as well. Uh, my last question before I let you go, just in, in talking about this surface-to-surface -surface missile and the aero defense system that was used by the U.S., Israel, there, kind of in a conglomeration. Maybe how important is that aero defense system, and, and can you give me a breakdown on what is, because this is potentially one of the first times it was used. Correct. I think it's been used maybe, I think, twice, three times, something like that, uh, since the Israelis have had it. There have not been a lot of long-range threats. Um, but what's important here is that the, with the help of the United States, um, we have seen actually there are three systems that the Israelis have. We have Iron Dome, which everybody hears about. That's the short-range system, and that's 90 to 95 percent accurate. It has kept Israel largely intact. There's no guarantees that that's what happens in the future. But up until now, we've seen really an incredible display by Iron Dome. That's the short range system. Then you have David Sling, which is the mid range system. So that's the kind of thing that would intercept rockets coming from, let's say, Iraq or, you know, uh, or maybe even eastern Syria, for that matter. 
Uh, and then you've got the long range system. And this system has just shown you what would happen if Iran tries to start uh, lobbing rockets at Israel. Um, and the fact that this integrated three layer system seems to be working um, is, I think, has to be a good sign to Israelis, but also to the United States, because this is technology that they will have access to. The U.S. military will uh, and already has started looking at what the Israelis bring to the table. The Israelis have incredible military technology. They have actually another system I've been hearing a lot about since the ground war started. It's called the Trophy and uh, Tank Protection System, uh, where it actually hits anti-tank missiles when they're fired at the tank, and, and it protects the tanks. It's kept them all intact so far, as I understand it. So a lot of good tech for the United States to dig into after this is all done, maybe some acquisitions um, if everything goes the right way. All right, that'll be very interesting. Uh, thank you for breaking it all down. A very complicated story, to say the least, with these latest developments that are coming in minute by minute, hour by hour. Uh, you broke it down very well. Uh, Jonathan Shanzer, thank you so much for joining us here on Live Now from Fox. It's always great to hear from you. Anytime. All right, thank you so much. All right, we're going to continue here on Live Now from Fox. Uh, I'm Andy Mack, of course, a live.